looking back over my tracks. This is what I see, black people in slavery, the bark of the dog, the crack of the whip. You better run, black boy, if massa catch you with me. So we are marching for freedom to die for this homeland, either death or victory for me. Congress passed a law in 1940 that allowed for the U.S. Virgin Islands to have their committees admitted to Saneys. It's my understanding, although we haven't been able to verify many of these facts, is that there was no uh, facility in the Virgin Islands that was qualified to take care of people for a longer period of inpatient hospitalization. Congress, again, made it possible for Virgin Islands because we were, uh, we had just by relieved uh, from under the guidance or, or the servitude of the United States Navy. And so they figured, well, we will take these people that are mentally ill from our, this U.S. territory. And what's interesting about that is that people were already severely ill. Whether that illness was a bona fide psychiatric illness or a neurological illness or even mental retardation, as they called it in those days, um, it didn't make any difference. These people were put on a, a, a boat from here. They would land in New York and then be put on a bus and transported down to Washington, D.C., none of which was familiar to them. So this major disorientation had begun from the time they got on the first boat because a lot of these people had not even been in a car. We found census data that says in 1941 there were 44 individuals from the U.S. Virgin Islands he cared for here at St. Elizabeth's. From 1941 until 1987, when the last Virgin Islander was admitted here under that law, uh, there's approximately 250 to 300 individuals were cared for here. By the time I saw the records, I was able to scrutinize the medical records of some of these people. I noticed a couple things that happened. One of the things was that some of the patients had lobotomies, and I'm not sure that permission was given for those lobotomies. The second thing was that um, a lot of the, these people died. Some of them died. And they ended up in graves that are still, I think, around St. Elizabeth's Hospital. I can tell you uh, we have two individuals that I have very good records on. One of them stayed here for 28 years. The other one stayed here for 31 years. That is far longer than a length of stay that would otherwise um, have occurred if the person was, for instance, from the District of Columbia. The costs to the Virgin Islands government were initially, I, I guess, zero. There was always a cost to the patients <clears throat> because they were separate from their, separated from their families and their culture. And we ended up owing millions of dollars. The worst part about residential care is that you have, in effect, taken the patient and separated them from their community, from what is familiar to them. So they cannot participate in the therapy, in the counseling, in the treatment. And so if that person is away for a year or more, they've kind of lost touch with what is familiar. Those charges became prohibitive. And what happened is that we tried to respond to it by trying to build facilities in the Virgin Islands. Uh, none was built on St. Croix. In St. Thomas, there was uh, the Michelle Motel. Michelle Motel on St. Thomas was being used by the government of the Virgin Islands as a long-term care facility. It was deplorable conditions. I mean, there were, ma there were mattresses on the floor. Um, heck, staff was, was almost nil. There, was, there were just people there to maintain the residents to be sure they stayed within the facility. There's a total lack of mental health care services. And then they built, maybe 10 years ago, the Elger Shelterburn facility, which was something that we could have transitioned people from places like St. Elizabeth's. In the meantime, of course, we still had people that needed long-term care. And what the Virgin Islands government was forced to do, beginning I believe in the 90s, was to send these people that needed long-term care off-island. Because the Virgin Islands did not have a facility to hold people 
um, criminally convicted as not guilty by reason of insanity. And so they were there at, at Michelle Motel too, but they would say they were the less violent ones. To the tune that between the education, health, and human services, I believe, I can't say that I'm sure, but I believe that we spend somewhere between 15 and maybe 20, mid-20s in millions of dollars a year to take care of those folk that are from the Virgin Islands that need long-term care. The Virgin Islands had a very small population in the 50s and 60s. With the, as I mentioned, passage of the Community Mental Health Systems Act in the mid-60s, the Virgin Islands received funding like every other state and territory to build community mental health clinics. And therefore, there was an increase in mental health services during the 70s, where, as I understand it, they had psychiatrists on board, they had psychologists, they had a, even an outreach team. They had a public health um, psychiatric nurse who were all part of the mental health services system under the Department of Health, and they created the Division of Mental Health. What you're describing is the birth of the public health and community mental health system. And I will give full credit to Dr. Chester Coltman, who is another native son, came back from training in the States and was completely committed to creating a community mental health system here in the territory. He was then the commissioner of health and in his tenure, he took community-based people, he trained them, and he located them just as has you've described in each of the communities. Basically, what was happening is that we were able to take the services to the people. Because the truth of the matter is the way that mental health care is structured, the structure is a barrier to care. You want to have the mental health care provided as close to the individual as possible in the school, in the home, in the community. Not that they have to get, you know, and go some far away place. It's hard for me to talk about how it started failing because, you know, much of the start of the failing took place after I left. But my, my focus was to teach people behavioral skills. First of all, they were easier to teach. Uh, and it was easier to take a population of folks who may not have been classically trained in uh, various mental health uh, disciplines and teach them good functional skills to interact with clients and to change clients' behavior. It used to be that the Division of Mental Health had personnel who worked in the hospital. We had nurse, nurses that worked inside the psychiatric unit. They belonged to, to health, not the hospital. And so there was a good flow back and forth on what was going on in the hospital and what was going on in the community. Well, that, that, that was phased out. But we still had workers that would go up to the hospital. About that, that was one of the things that I used to do. I used to go to the hospital maybe twice a week, go up on the unit, see who's up there. Or uh, if I didn't put them up there, or have them put up there myself, I would go and check on who I had sent up there or who was up there. And we would work out a plan while they're in the hospital for them to come back into the community, work with their families, get everything all set up. And then in the 70s also, we had the Community Mental Health Act, which brought a lot of monies into outpatient programs. We developed, there were like 13 or more different programs under the Community Mental Health Act. Services for children, services for inmates or detained people, for the elderly. Human Services Department ran very well because they kept their leaders in place, even when there was a political change. <laughs> With the health department, that didn't happen. When the, when, the when the politics, when a new political person came in, he brought in his new, a new P 
people, and their priorities may not have been what the old set of priorities were. You needed somebody in place over the long run so that you would have a, a smooth transition from political change to political change. And in the late 70s, I, I was the one psychiatrist here. I would go to St. Thomas and St. John. We'd, go, we'd make home visits on St. Croix, St. Thomas, and St. John. The team would go there. And then when all these people came in, uh, Dr. Maxwell Jones came to St. Croix. He was the founder of uh, the community, the, the uh, therapeutic community. And he had recruited a large number of people from the mainland uh, who were predominantly white uh, to uh, come and uh, implement the Community Mental Health Center's grant. Uh, it was a lot, lots of federal money. Um, that grant had a requirement for uh, a, a local matching fund. Unfortunately, a few things happened in the Virgin Islands that undermined the continuation of that movement. Um, a major issue that occurred in the mid-80s was the change as a savings measure in the way that mental health services were funded on the federal level. When I came in 1987, mental health was getting a federal block grant of two and a half million dollars every year. Instead of having a block grant to the territories, they said we're going to treat the territories the same as the states and we're going to a per capita. So instead of having the money available, whether we had a hundred thousand or, or a million people, it was based on the amount of people in your population. And so we went from two and a half million down to about a little under 300,000, and of course it's been cut back ever since. The government never really matched that grant with cash. So it was always a, a situation where the government did some kind of finagling of in-kind services. The problem with, the, uh, with that was that the Community Mental Health Center's grant was a grant of decreasing dollars. It was a long-term grant, but each year when you renewed your plans, uh, you submitted your, uh, your report uh, and renewed your plans, the federal amount would decline and the local amount was supposed to increase in the amount of the federal declination. And that never really happened. That was really the built-in demise of the mental health system. So you can imagine that all of the services that were out in the community had to be consolidated back into the two centers that I've talked about, at, um, up at Charles Harwood and down at Frederickstead Health Center. And the same thing happened in St. Thomas. And uh, today, it, I mean, you wouldn't recognize it today based on what it was when I first came here. You know, a lot of people were trying to get into mental health, the professionals were trying to get into mental health in those days. Today, they hardly have a, a staff to go around to do the work that they needed. Uh, when I go down to Frederickstead, there's only one worker down there. And then the doctor comes in and a nurse comes in and once or twice a week, but the, but the people that do, that are involved in the groundwork, there's hardly anybody there to, to do it on a, on a daily basis. Christian State Clinic is a little better up in Charles Howard, but, uh, but it's far below where it used to be. Right now, we don't have enough counselors outpatient. We don't have enough staff inpatient. We don't even have a, a, a facility inpatient here. Um, we don't have the kinds of programs that we had, the outreach programs, the community programs, the, the special services, but we don't have any of these anymore. So we're just now running at, at bare bones, skeletal um, 
profile of, of services that we're providing to people on this island. Uh, I tip my hat off to those people in mental health who still find it possible to provide counseling services to the people in these islands. Because the fewer counseling services you have, the more medication you got to use. And I would love for us to have a, a million counselors so I don't have to give any medications. The short end of the stick were the persons with mental illness getting flow of dollars to maintain the services that were in place. And so they totally got left out of the picture over a number of administrations. And a lot of the services that were in place disappeared. A lot of the people and continuity and the systems in place disappeared. So that's why we got to the time around 1999, 2000, you get the INTAC report, which basically reflected the demise of what was in place and given some recommendations of what you need to do to revamp, rejuvenate, and get a functioning mental health care system in place in the Virgin Islands. The police, of course, were somewhat a recipient of the lack of mental health services being in place because they were the ones picking up people. As a matter of fact, I think the police department had to hire a psychiatrist. I have a paper that if it states that if I p fell back into this situation of losing my consciousness, I have to be hospitalized. There's no hospital here for, for me. I would have to either go to Puerto Rico or Florida to be hospitalized. Medication are costly. Our people that does not have a, the, the meds are the same people that are walking the streets. Why? Because no one gives a damn or care about what's going on here. They have, they have, pair, they have families and the families say, oh, she's crazy. And that's it. No, she's not crazy. She has a condition. As we know, our governor's son is a hyperactive. He has a condition. He has parents. His parents work. They have money. They could, they could afford to help their son. What happened to a person that doesn't have income? We need our health patients, our dis disabled patients, equal. I think in most part, people that is in control or running mental health I think there's a disconnection in, in reference to our understanding and any deep concern. And, and you know, the old people will say, if you don't feel it, you don't know it. And I, I think the, because of the ignorance, they don't understand the depth in which it have an effect, you know, on the family and the society and as a whole. I watch my son's situation and medication and half, and I, I see where he could be an asset instead of a, a liability to society. But for some reason, the system seems to be failing him in reference to getting him to that level. My family member's condition is schizophrenia. My brother's name is Kenroy Watson. My child's name is Andrea. He has been diagnosed as a schizophrenic Catatonic. She was diagnosed with schizophrenia. My son has PTSD. My daughter's condition is postpartum depression. I am a parent of two adult children, both diagnosed with mental illness. He was in the Iraq war. My struggle, my struggles. The struggle with my son is that he's bipolar. Taking her medication. The lack of the medical expertise on the island. She was misdiagnosed. The understanding how to access the different types of services that are available in the territory, um, in addition to the financial services, that's an extreme struggle for us. I went to Social Security. I was denied twice already. I went to Lutheran Services for housing for him. They said he's not housing material. My struggle is trying to get a place for my son. When your child has a problem. Where does he come when no one else is going to take care of him? He's going to come home. So even right now, my son has to live in the States because there's more services for him there. 
But the problem there is, is that I'm not there to advocate for him. My greatest problem is she is my only child. So who is going to come and assist her? Who is going to be there? So I must say with a mental health system that is very lacking, that those individuals who are living in residential or support programs off island need to find a place to come back here. We need to build our system. We need to do so not only with government, but also with the support of nonprofits and families. So I must say after 13 years of being away and living and, and being in remission and finding the medications that work, she is stable. And I must say thanks to the support of family as well as friends. But we need to turn and look at our system, our government system and our system here at home to be, be able to provide those services to all our, our clients. My first meeting with J uh, Jeff Nelson was an eye-opener for me in that Jeff Nelson indicated that psychiatry was a lost leader and it was one of the places that they really had to look at in terms of trying to stabilize uh, the financial well-being of the hospital. We need to make sure that we have the best care, the best care in all areas that we have, and this is one of those areas that we've decided to move on. We're moving those patients as we speak. Uh, some of those patients are being discharged to their home, but the patients that are not are gonna be moved to uh, Fort Lauderdale. We're not doing anything different that the community has already experienced, at least on St. Thomas, but it's a process that is secure the patients, make sure they're stabilized, make sure we're giving them the right care, and then move them to the right place. And that is either to their home or to other locations. By closing down the psych unit, we have been displaced. There is no place for us to go. You go to the hospital, they try to send you back home. They don't want, they, they don't have any place to keep you when you want and need services. If tomorrow I have to go in, for help, I know it's not gonna be there. Because it shut down, it put people back in the streets. It, 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 it's, it's hard to know that you have an island that has no hospital, because that's a shell. The psych unit immediately, being shut, immediately created a backflow. Patients couldn't get past the emergency room. Those were there, and then they tried this notion of sending people to St. Thomas, which had significant implications for a lot of reasons, but most significant to me was this whole issue of confidentiality. You see somebody walking with a nurse going on a seaplane and acting a little strange, that's an outing that should never have happened. The other thing is that since people can't get on the unit, uh, the St. Thomas thing was rough on staff, it was rough on the patients, it was rough on the family, and it was rough on the St. Thomian staff also, because they then had the extra burden of dealing with extra patients. The driving engine in America behind the healthcare system is the insurance industry. How dollars are spent, be they HMOs or be they um, you know, rehabilitation centers, what drives the doctors, what drives the system, unfortunately, is the dollar. And unfortunately, that leaves a lot of people out from under that umbrella of care because it doesn't generate money. Why do we have a dialysis unit here in the Virgin Islands? It wasn't any when I first got here, but because Medicare or Medicaid pays for it, now you have independent dialysis units. So therefore, what, what is more apparent than what drives what services are available than the dollar. You'll see now laser units or doctors coming down and doing eye care because it can be paid by insurance, what better place to live than doing laser surgery and you know collecting dollars. Psychiatry never made money because you, if you stop and think about it, these are the people that were least likely to have jobs and maintain health insurance and so on, you know, because of the nature of their illnesses. I found myself leaving that institution uh, shortly after Jeff Nelson came. And then when the word was that came out that the psych unit was in fact shuttered, 
in no way should we just drop some negative aspersions on the staff of that psychiatric facility because there had been issues that had to do with administrative issues, with management issues, with financial issues, and the whole gamut. So let us not just point our fingers specifically on the psych unit. The decision to close the unit um, was made by, by my predecessor. Um, because at the time, um, there were a couple of inc incidences where quality of care was, was affected. And so um, the cen Center of Medicare and Medicaid Services had actually um, known about it, and um, they wanted us to, to address it and to address it immediately. We ne needed to fix this problem. The solution would have been to um, start over again, to either train your staff that was presently there or to remove those staff and to, be, and to put some new staff in. However, um, the decision was made to take that as an opportunity to revamp the, in, the entire unit. Once the decision was made to close that unit, we could not re reopen it. It shut down and it created some serious repercussions. Because if we remember correctly, the word was that we're shutting it down to do repairs and we're going to reopen. And then after about a year or eight months, you heard that, oh, we can't reopen because to reopen it's going to cost over a million dollars. Whereas when we shut it down, it would have cost maybe $100,000 to refurbish it, get it back up to, to caliber, and then go, go back in. In the meantime, other things started happening. And one of the things that happened, more arrests. Young people in their teens arrested, taken to prison for going into a store and walking out with something, but inappropriate. And you could see that they're hearing voices or just not being real. Uh, older people. And, and so this whole thing now has created, instead of inpatient, at Governor Juan and Fluey Hospital, they know in patients at, in the jail. And, and that, in my opinion, is inhumane. As far as the hospital not having a psych unit, that's a big, that's a big blow for us. Because for acute patients, when we have patients that have acute um, episodes, we transport them to the emergency room and they're stabilized or housed in the, they used to be housed in the, at least for 30 days on the psych unit that would allow them to have access to other mental health workers that have the resources that we don't have. But now with the closing of the psych unit, that's not a possibility. They, what we do is we, we do send them to the emergency room, but all they do is stabilize them and send them right back here. It's a disservice to them and it's a disservice to us. We have the added burden of not being able to uh, pay for the services that, that the hospital is, is providing to us. So not being able to pay for the services we're not, we can't make any demands on the, on the hospital for as far as you know, what kind of services our patients would receive because we don't have the support of leadership as far as government leadership because I don't think it is recognized in the Virgin Islands that you don't just house um, mentally ill patients in a, in a jail. Just, you don't take somebody who is suffering from cardiac um, disease or diabetes or any other illness and you know just put them in jail. Mental illness is a disease just like any other disease. It's an illness. One of the things that you are going to be shocked at, when I say you, I mean somebody who doesn't work either in the prison or in the hospital. But at Golden Grove, I've got more psychiatric patients than the hospital, the two hospitals combined. What does that tell you? That tells you what has been done with patients who need to be in a hospital or need to be in mental health system. They are arrested, they're thrown in there. And the reason is that they're off the street, out of sight, out of mind, number one. Number two, their families are as, as bad as it is. Their families sometimes say, well, thank God he's not gonna kill me. Because that's what happens a lot of, they're beaten up on their own families. Number three, they are there because they committed a crime 
that may be serious, it may be just a nuisance crime, but they've been doing it every day. They go into businesses and they would urinate or they would just walk in and take place or threaten customers. This has been happening and it happens all over. But guess what? They end up in our system and I've had mentally ill people who came into the prison, never had a trial for three years and have been in there. And is, whose fault is that? Well, guess what? Sometimes the families say, Doc, I went and I saw them and they looked much better than when they were there. At least I know, and this is hard, at least I know they're in a safe place where I don't have to wonder if they got killed last night. Because we've had that also. There was one year when we had three or four mentally ill patients killed on St. Croix. So there are a number of factors and cross currents that occurred which contributed to the demise of the mental health system and focusing on trying to revive it and get the continuity of care is essentially why we brought the lawsuit to get all the parties on the table, first of all, get them out of denial and say, yes, we don't have a functioning mental health system, let's put one in place and that's what occurred in 2009 when we finally got the consent judgment, a settlement agreement with the government of Virgin Islands to start working on a strategic plan to put a functioning mental health care system back in place in the Virgin Islands. With the class action, they brought out to light the things that we need. We need a psychologist. We don't have a psychologist. We need, um, we need a, another psychi psychiatrist. We only have one psychiatrist. She only works two days, two days in Fredericksted and two days or three days in Christianster. And we need somebody full time at the Frederick State Clinic and somebody full time at the Christian State Clinic. Yo necesito un psiquiatra. Necesito medicamento. Necesito yo y mi gente. Necesitamos un psiquiatra que filme en Santa Cruz. Sé que hay mucho más de 300 gente que necesita atención y no va para el hospital porque ya cerraron el sitio. Necesito el sitio abierto de nuevo porque necesitamos sacar a nuestra gente fuera de la calle que cogen peligro y va a un carro y le da. Necesito de todos los senadores, gobernador, que por favor pasen el número 722 y el 723 y es nosotros somos el gobierno. And I think that's what we're trying to address in the lawsuit as well is that the community has to maintain involvement about the type of care and what they want for care because who is the government but the people. The people must step up and speak out for what they want. In order to get what you need for your society, you need to be a part of the process. We are closely monitoring um, the development of a comprehensive health care plan for the territory. And I think all of us who have worked in this area, we know what needs to be done. And the the thing is going to be of course the funding because it's not going to be cheap. We have allowed mental health services to go by the wayside for a number of years. It's not going to be cheap but I do not think we can avoid the issue any longer. I think the only thing that we can resolve and I want us to resolve is to resolve the misinformation, the stigmatization, the um, you know, the, the discrimination that is visited on people with mental illness. I want a person to be as comfortable to say, well, you know what, I really have to go take my antidepressants because, you know, I'm having such um, a reaction to the lack of sun and that really forces me into a depression. So, excuse me, let me go do that. 
I would like people to be as comfortable for coming for mental health checkups once a year as they are for coming for physical checkups. And I want people to understand that mental illness is an illness, just like any other illness. The content of the strategic plan really calls for a public-private partnership where the Department of Health would be the purchaser and regulator of services and either through nonprofits or other entities have outside parties be the direct service providers. And, but the commission, um, well, I will, I will say the strategic plan implementation committee is really involved in overseeing the restructuring and renovation of the, the uh, mental health services here in the Virgin Islands. And through that collaboration, it's really a public private partnership because we have not only government officials, some of the plaintiff class who are like representatives of the National Alliance of the Mentally Ill for St. Thomas and St. Uh, Croix. We have, we're asking for independent psychological associations. We're asking for the University of Virgin Islands personnel to sit in. So we have input from every sector of the delivery system for mental health services at the table, deciding how the services should be put in place. So it's not just the government alone, but all citizens who have anything connection with the uh, delivery of mental health services being involved in implementing the, st the strategic plan. I'm looking back over my tracks. This is what I see, like people in slavery, the back of the dog. The crack of the whip, you better run black boy, it's massa catch you with me. So we are marching for freedom, to die for this homeland, either death or victory for me.